Thank you very much, Brian and Tim, for being here with us this morning to talk about the incredible journey you two have shared together. Um, to begin, um, Brian, can you set the stage for us? You were 20, 21 when you were convicted. What was your, what was your life then? What had it been? Um, so, you know, my life, you know, I thought that I was, had a, a pretty good trajectory. I was um, going to college. I had a 4.0. My plan was uh, to, after graduation, attend law school and, you know, hopefully be in a room like this at, at some point, uh, you know, doing good work for, uh, you know, deserving um, clients. But uh, in 2002, uh, so when I was 21, uh, that's when, when I was convicted and all of that kind of shifted. I mean, I had been working for Arnold Porter as a paralegal um, and, you know, had, had dreamed of uh, attending Georgetown Law School. Um, but that was very much different from the situation that I found myself in uh, after the conviction, a conviction that, you know, completely caught me off guard and, and for which I didn't really come to grips with uh, until actually much, much later. So it was kind of a, a denial situation. I couldn't believe that, that it had happened, but it was something nevertheless that, you know, that I had to, uh, to deal with. Tim, Covington has taken on a number <clears throat> of these types of cases. Um, how did the firm initially get involved in Brian's case, and, and what did you find compelling about his case in well, particular? Actually, actually um, Brian's mother, uh, Lynn Bush, reached out to Eric Holder uh, and asked Eric if, if we would take a look at the case. And this often happens. We get outreach from different people asking us to look at cases. And there were two pieces of it that I thought were particularly compelling. One was there was this very, very serious question of factual innocence. Um, and uh, you, you don't know when you look at a case on the, on the cold papers, you don't know exactly whether you can prove that case, but it sure looked like a case of factual innocence that we had to pursue. And then also, this sentence for a 21-year-old of life without parole was something that I thought we should get involved in. We should get involved in cases uh, where people have been sentenced to, to, that, um, to that sentence. Not a death sentence, but life without parole. And, and, and I've been very interested in having our firm get involved in some of those cases. Can you talk a little bit about the progression of the representation? So, so we had an original group of probably about 10 lawyers uh, who, who worked on the case originally. Over time, we had 48 lawyers who worked on the case, a big team of both partners and associates. It ended up, a, as the video said, it was over 10 years of work and uh, ended up over 12,000 hours of time. So it was a, a tremendous investment by the firm. We ended up hiring investigators and experts and, um, and so it was a big project for us over, over a multi-year period. So, Tim, for the firm, what were some of the most challenging aspects about Brian's case? Well, well this was a tough case. And I, I said on the video, we, we knew it was going to be a very, very difficult matter. It, I thought it was one in 100 at best. I didn't tell you that to you, Brian, right away. But I, it, was a tough, oh, it, I was a, it was a tough theory because we took the case on after direct appeal. And our theory was ineffective assistance of counsel for failure to develop um, a, a, a claim of factual innocence and failure to develop uh, proof that somebody else had committed the murder. And so it required us essentially to reprove and redevelop the case. And that was why it was such a large project for us and so much work went into it finding wit. We found the witnesses who were able to testify ultimately at an evidentiary hearing that somebody else had admitted to the crime. And this was not done by the trial lawyer, but that's always a tough fight because you're essentially rethinking a case. We are questioning the work of a very well-respected trial lawyer in West Virginia who had represented Brian at trial. We had an incredibly hostile judge, Brian mentioned, that we, we ended up having to uh, uh, seek the judge's recusal and she was really hostile to us and that was a very tough moment in the case. She threatened to throw uh, one of the partners in jail in one of the hearings. So, <laughs> so it, it, was, it, was, it was a very, it, the legal issues and the factual challenges were, were substantial. And uh, so, so we really understood all along that this was, this was a rare case to win. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm under no illusions as to who, you know, I'm in the room with and, and, and how much you all do uh, in your respective uh, offices and, and firms. And I know that, you know, next year, 
two or three years from now, there will be somebody sitting at home living, you know, a, a blessed life because of the work that you do in the coming weeks or, or year. And, you know, I think that all of, of you all, I am for, on behalf of those folks, proud and, and happy and grateful to all of you for what you do. Um, my ask is just that you continue and, and that you uh, a, attempt to, you know, look at, give eyes to as many cases as possible. There are people obviously uh, all throughout prison and the prison systems that are in prison for things that, that they have done. Now, whether or not they should have gotten the amount of time that they got or different kind of factors, that, that's an issue. But there are a lot of people, uh, some of whom I know personally, uh, who are innocent and who are in prison right now, either facing a death penalty or a life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is an extended death penalty, um, and don't have an avenue, don't have a voice. And so you can't imagine how much of a light you all are and can be uh, to just, even if it's assisting attorneys that are working on their cases, having other resources available um, to them is something that can be a life changer. And so my ask is just that you all continue with what you're doing and that you talk to the chairman and the chairwomen of your of your firms and, and, and get them to really buy into looking into and taking on uh, more cases because there's so many people who have cases who where it's obvious that they shouldn't be in prison, but they can't get, they don't have a voice. Together, I was given a second, you know, opportunity at life to try to, you know, make myself successful, but more than that, to be able to give back because had it, and I tell, you know, people all the time that Tim, all the, the, the associates, all the partners, all the paralegals and the other staff um, at Covington, had it not been for everything that they did for my case and for me, I wouldn't be here. And, you know, they didn't have necessarily a dog in the fight. I mean, you know, they were invested after they took the case, but it wasn't necessary. It wasn't required for them to take it. And so they did it because they believed in me and my case. And so what I try to do is at every opportunity or as much as I can to give back to other people because I would be completely remiss to have such a blessing bestowed on me and then to just go and, you know, live my life in some corner somewhere. I try to make sure that people who are similarly situated or who are going through issues, especially around this issue, around criminal justice, um, coming home from, from incarceration, uh, those kinds of things which present so many barriers for people, I try to do what I can to make their lives better. And I was in a situation where I was um, not struggling for where I'm going to have my next meal or, or where I was going to get clothes on my back. And those are real issues that people face every day when they come home. Um, from incarceration. So not only are you trying to navigate a completely new and foreign landscape to you having done however many years in prison, um, because you know cities and towns and counties are changing all the time, but you're doing that <clears throat> with a criminal record oftentimes with the stigma of having been to prison. Um, and it's just a difficult situation when you're doing all of that and then on top of that, you don't have the resources to even get the bare minimum of, uh, of, of, of support. So support for people who are going through that has been kind of what I've been doing and where I've been orienting myself since. I think that the Covington represents um, a mentality, a principle, uh, 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 an ideal that saved my life. And I want to give back to that ideal, which is to help people who might not necessarily have a voice, might not necessarily have an opportunity to do something for themselves. So.